Hi, and welcome to Newsmakers. Tonight, the first of an occasional series of in-depth interviews with eyewitnesses and Santa Barbarans who played key roles in the Thomas Fire and Montecito mudslide disaster. I'm your host, Jerry Roberts, and we're honored and delighted tonight to welcome Mike Eliason, Public Information Officer for Santa Barbara County Fire. Mike is uh, widely known and widely respected as a news photographer. He worked 30 years in the media locally. And in his current incarnation, uh, for weeks, he was at ground zero of the natural disasters that struck our community. And he came back with a remarkable visual record, which we're going to see and talk about tonight. Mike, welcome, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, where were you when you first heard about the Thomas Fire? Actually, when the fire first began on uh, December 4th, uh, I was um, teaching a CERT class, which is a community emergency response training class um, at the, at, for that location was at the Red Cross. And it's a, it's a community class that was, um, teaches and empowers uh, the community uh, how to prepare for disasters, fires, floods, uh, earthquakes. We give a little bit of information on how, just how to basically take care of yourself and your neighbors and your neighborhood. And that fire began that night, and uh, um, it was in Ventura County when it, when it started near Santa Paula. And Santa Barbara County Fire has 16 fire stations, and we actually sent 14 engines to the fire the first couple hours of the fire. Um, but we were still able to fill and, and be able to provide protection and, and service for our constituents, but that shows you how fast that fire was moving. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that a lot of people don't know about you is that you have... Uh, been a, uh, a reserve firefighter for many years. Started in the in the 1980s. Uh, That's correct. I started. I and you sort of had parallel careers. So you told me the first natural <laughs> disaster that you worked uh, was the Wheeler fire in 1985. That was actually the very first fire that I photographed was the Wheeler fire in '85. And I, I did work for the Carp and Summerlin Fire Department back in the late 80s and 90s um, as a reserve firefighter for them, and and that's where I was able to gain a lot of this experience. Yeah, and you've seen so much. Well, how, how would you characterize what we have just been through to everything else you've seen as a journalist and a firefighter? Well, the big thing for the, for the Thomas fire is that this fire started in Santa Paula, and it burned homes in Montecito in December. And that's like something we've never seen before. The, the rate of spread of that fire, how quickly that moved, how quickly that consumed so much acreage in such a short amount of time was unbelievable for many firefighters who have worked this area for so many years. And uh, mudslides? As the mudslides, we didn't, we didn't know, um, and we, we prepared for it. We had actually prepositioned uh, resources from the Long Beach Fire Department, their Swift Water Rescue team, and we had a regional task force uh, of Swift Water Rescue uh, firefighters, and they drove around the areas um, and tried to figure out where these hot spots would be if the rains did come that night. Um, the rains did come. It, I, I saw the radar as it was, as it was approaching. It was, it was just this the worst case scenario you think of. You, you figure Montecito is a rectangle, and there was this long, straight blob of red that went right up over Montecito, and that's where that got hit the worst. Um, so right after that, is it, we didn't know the extent of the damage until daylight. Yeah. All right, uh, we're going to look at Mike's pictures, and that's really um, how I want to spend most of the show. Um, st let's start with the with the fire, and uh, uh, just tell us what we're seeing. Well, this was in the fire actually entered Santa Barbara County. This is in the early morning hours of December 10th. Uh, that Sunday morning, the fire crossed over into our county. This is up in Shepherd's Mesa Road area off of Shepherd's Mesa Lane. This is uh, some engine companies that were actually from San Bernardino County that were here and uh, that were already assigned to the fire and they were providing structure protection for a home. They saved that home as that fire advanced uh, onto it. Uh, they were able to keep those, those flames at bay and uh, protect it and save that home. All right, um, and this is? This is another home that's up off of Shepherd's Mesa and that, that's just to give you an idea of the size of those flames, that's a two-story house. And those flames behind it are easily 100-foot flame lengths, 75-foot flame lengths. How close were you? Um, that wasn't too close. I was a, a little bit ways away. Um, but that house that we just saw 
was that house that we were staying at before as the fire, uh, as fire approached. And that house was saved as well. Wow. They didn't lose any of those homes up on top. Wow. Okay, what do we got here? This is that the fire progressed into the county. This is up off Romero Canyon in Montecito. Um, and as you can see off to the left, that's my uh, uh, truck that I have. And I was with some engines that were there as they were providing uh, structure protection to the different homes that were up in that canyon. You can barely see behind my, my truck that there was actually a home that oh, was yeah. there yeah. Um, as the fire kind of crept down into that canyon. Um, again, they did a great job saving some of those homes in some very steep and rugged terrain that those houses were built. And, and the firefighters did a phenomenal job of saving those homes. Amazing images. This, I thought, was kind of the defining yeah, this is Christmas hole. in California is kind of is kind of the way it took off with. It, this is in Carpinteria as the fire uh, the, uh, approached. And again, this was one of those amazing things that it was December and this fire, you know, was the, how fast it was moving. It was not moving. Not exactly the traditional fire season. No, it's not. And, and in California, there is no longer a fire season. With the drought and, uh, and, and the, the, the dead and decaying vegetation, the fire season is year round, and Plus we're, we're climate, seeing that. Climate. And, well, regardless of your politics, however you feel, it, things are burning not the way they usually do. Yeah. And this is unprecedented for our area. And, and this um, picture just kind of said this home had already been evacuated. This was up behind Carpentry High School. And this is, uh, I'm actually looking through an avocado orchard at this tree decoration that was in front of a home that had already been evacuated as the fire burned behind. All right. What do we got? That's, that's one of our hand crew, uh, Santa Barbara County Fire's uh, hand crew. And, and those folks, uh, those men and women on all those hand crews do a, trem a tremendous job. It's a thankless job. And they are out there sleeping in the dirt, climbing those hills with 50-pound packs, um, basically doing hand-to-hand -hand combat with these flames with rudimentary hand tools. And we were up in Santa Monica Canyon. They did a firing out operation trying to uh, uh, take away some of that unburned fuel to protect those homes. And this was one of the firefighters who was just keeping an eye on the hillside, making sure there was no spotting and making sure the fire didn't get around behind the crew. All right. This is that same crew later. This is up off Bella Vista in Montecito. You can tell they've been working. Um, they were, had just cleared a, a fire break and they were taking a quick breather as a helicopter in the distance was uh, you know, dampening down some of those hot spots with, uh, with the oh, Bambi yeah, bucket. Right. You can see it there so right he's knocking that ridge. down. Yeah. And so shortly thereafter, they you know, got all together and they started hiking off into the hills uh, to do more of that hard work that and they do. And they're working 24 hours, yeah, you said? Yeah, they do. And sometimes they get, they get what's called spiked, which means they will be carried out by helicopter out into the remote wilderness. And they will sleep in the dirt, sleep under the stars, and have food and equipment shuttled to them via an, uh, an aircraft. And uh, they will do that hand-to-hand -hand combat. I assume these are younger men. <laughs> they are younger men, but uh, and and women. And women. And they are hard-working folks, and and they deserve a lot of the credit. Those are the folks that put a lot of these fires out. Those and dozers uh, uh, work in concert together, and they put these wildland fires out. Yeah. Wow. This was new for uh, Santa Barbara County. I had not seen one of these working uh, a fire in, in our county. This was one of two super scoopers um, that was attached to the fire, and they would work with the helicopters. Um, this is in Gibraltar Canyon, and they would go and, and, and they would work on 11 minute cycles. So they would uh, make their water drops and they would fly together, one and then right after the first drop, a second one would drop, and then they would fly back to Lake Kachuma and pick up the water. And then in between, the helicopters would come into the airspace and continue to soak those stubborn hot spots and then clear the airspace when they came back in. So they really had to work well. It, it, when you are dealing with large aircraft that are lumbering, they can't maneuver as quickly as helicopters or smaller aircraft, you, it's really an aerial ballet. And it's a tribute to these aerial firefighters that really work together to, to put these fires out. Now, are these local guys flying? The, these are not. I do not know where these ones are based. Um, we don't have any of these type we of don't aircraft have in our county um, at all. So I'm not sure where those where those uh, super scoopers now, were based. Where, okay. This is in that same canyon. After the super scoopers made their drop, the sky cranes would come in and they would drop their water. Again, you can see the stubborn smokes that were on these steep, rugged terrains that you just couldn't get to by foot. So they were doing their best to try and get in there and uh, drop the water and to keep, you know, putting those little spots out. Wow. Wow. 
This is the tough job. These are the, the firefighters. This is, again, a Santa Barbara County firefighter. And you can see they, they laid 10,000 feet of hose Two just miles. for one section of this fire. Two miles. And you got to multiply that at how big this fire was. You can imagine how many miles and miles of hose was laid. Um, this is a section just off East Camino Cielo. The firefighter's hiking down. In addition to that 50-pound pack that he already has for his personal safety gear, he's now carrying additional equipment, additional, additional sections of 100-foot hose. Um, additional. So that, that's 100 feet of hose on his back. On his back, and he's got several of those, and then he's got the uh, different uh, apparatus that go along with it. You have the gated Ys uh, and other sections of hose and else other tools that you need to bring. So you've got to hike down that hill. It's already... Uh, the ground is already uh, slippery because of the ash, and sometimes there's water being water dropped on it. You've got these burnt vegetation that have some time have broken off, so you've got these basic sticks that you can impale yourself on if you're not too uh, careful, climbing down the hill that's already slippery, and then you've got to negotiate that hill and extend that hose line. Um, so the, it's extreme teamwork that these folks do. Wow. Okay. I just keep saying wow. I mean, I'm just... I mean, I should, I, I do want to mention, Mike and I worked together for about four years, and he is the best news photographer that I have ever worked with in 30-some years in newspapering. And the thing about Mike is you send him out on something, and he would always come back with the page one picture. And uh, You're very kind. I think well, you can you. see that. I mean, incredible eye. All right, Oscar, let's go back to the, thank you. To the photographs. Um, this is um, uh, one of the aircraft, fixed-wing aircraft that were working the fire. This is a C-130 um, that came out of the Channel Islands Air National Guard base down in Ventura County. And they were working in concert with some of the other uh, fixed-wing, and it drops uh, fire retardant or water, one of the two, whatever they configure it with. And I believe he was dropping fire retardant here. Um, and he was just uh, in a kind of a holding pattern above, um, as the setting sun, up by Toro Canyon. Um, as they were working along the hillside trying to, you know, keep that fire away from homes. And you shot this all with your uh, smartphone? Too? Yeah. <laughs> Some of it actually I do. What I do is I, I kind of split it up. I, I shoot my videos. I do a lot of videos, and I shoot those with my iPhone. And I, I try to keep them 30 seconds because I know that's what TV likes. And I, would, I use Twitter. That's how I get my pictures out to the media. And, I, and I'm on Twitter, and, and I use still... Sometimes I'll use my phone, other times I have a regular 35 millimeter camera and it's Wi-Fi, so I'll take it with my long lenses and then I will transmit it to my phone and then I can tweet it out that way. So it, the days of dark rooms and the days of you know, laptop computers trying to transfer yeah. images are, are over. Because we need to get these pictures out as quick as we can to, you know, to keep the community because informed. Because, yeah, and the, and the community and yeah. the media used so many of your pictures yeah. and, and network TV and everybody else. Mike really became you know, one of the faces of the disaster, I think not only locally, but throughout the country and the world. There are two of us for County Fire Department. Dave Zanaboni, uh, Captain Dave Zanaboni, who was well known as well uh, with the media and the locals. Um, he, he is my boss, I work for him, he is my captain. And um, he is the primary uh, public information officer. Part of my duties is to assist him when he needs it, if he's away or if he's on vacation or if it's a larger incident. He may be back at the incident command post doing the meetings, dealing with the, the incident commanders, coordinating with um, trying to get press conferences, and all the, the uh, information out to the public, whereas I will be out in the field dealing with the, the media out in the field, getting pictures out, doing field interviews, and, and if he's away, then I'm doing that role. Additionally, my role is I'm do the public uh, education for the, for the department. So I have a 35-foot uh, trailer that I take around that's kind of a mini classroom and we take that to all of our schools that we service and um, we teach the third graders about fire safety and an engine company would come with us and we talk about the fire home fire dangers. That must be so cool. And it is. We had a school today and it was it was fun. The kids love it. It's a, it's, it's a rite of passage for a lot of the kids. They all remember um, the fire trailer coming and get to visit with the firefighters and tour the engine and see the house and, and have to climb out the ladder from the fire. And we do the social, social media in as well as teach uh, the CERT classes for the community. How do you always get the shot? I mean, your eye is just extraordinary. I mean, it's just... Wow. Um, I shoot a lot of pictures on my phone, and I, you know, it's like I always miss it. Yeah. <laughs> Where there's an, old, there's an old saying, and, and I 
if you're not close, if the picture's not good enough, you're not close enough. And, and I kind of lived by that. And it's, it's kind of an anticipation thing. And, and I, I, I'm my worst critic about my photography, and you know that, that I, I, don't, I don't think any of the pictures are tremendous. And I'm the person that will least tell you that about my pictures. But I just try to tell the story, convey the story in one, try and composite it in, compose it in one compelling image that's going to tell a story and elevate the reader or the viewer as to what's going on in their community. That's, that's what I've always tried to do. And, and I'm, I'm hopeful that I'm trying to live up to that. Yeah, well, you certainly are. All right, let's uh, look at some pictures of the slide and the flooding. Um, now, that boat yeah. uh, next to the sign, Mike, you carry in the trunk of your car to make <laughs> nice imagery, right? Yeah, no. This, this I is don't the 101? Know. This is the 101 uh, right underneath the Olive Mill overpass. And I don't know where the boat came from. Um, but as you can see, um, this is the 101 freeway, and it was easily 10 feet, 12 feet of water and mud. And when so this is the first morning. This is the first uh, one of the first mornings. Yeah, I think it's the second day. But this is shows the the uh, amount of water that came into this, and and the folks that live south of the 101, the Biltmore, the Bonnie Mead, uh, all those homes by the by the Miramar, they were very fortunate. Yes, they did have flooding. Yes, they did have damage. But it could have been far worse because the 101 acted as a catch basin, and all of that could have ended up further south of the freeway, and that would have been even more devastating for the community. Right. This was the early morning hours of the, of the flooding. This was around 4 a.m. Um, this shows um, the, the call came down originally, like I said, it was a, a vegetation fire. They didn't know what they had. The engines came in and were met with the flooding. This is at the near Hot Springs and Olive Mill. Um, the engine company that I met up with, um, we couldn't gain access because the power poles were across Hot Springs Road, and we didn't know if they were alive or not, and you got to treat every wire down as a live wire. So a gentleman opened up his gate and allowed access to us, and he showed us that there was another way around to these homes. We couldn't see. We didn't know. What we saw of the incident was just as much as our headlamps or our flashlights were lighting up. So that... That, that's all the lights is there. That's the all the light that we saw was is what we could see. So we knew that there were people. The gentleman had told us that there were houses down below. This isn't our, our, our area of responsibility. This is Montecito fires, but we so we didn't know the land as well as we know county fires responsibility. So but a lot of people know that everybody knows the town. So everybody knows the streets and everything. But we still didn't get where the we topography. were, the topography, because it, it, we couldn't see it. And then when daylight came, we really didn't understand it because all our landmarks were gone. All the trees, all the vegetation, everything was gone, wiped, just basically wiped clean. So the gentleman told us that there were houses down below. We walked down and we started to wade into, at some points, waist-deep mud, you know, mid-thigh most of the time. And as the firefighters started to make their uh, approach into this house, we got a half, about halfway in there, and then the thought dawned on everyone that, that one, we don't know where, really where we are, two, that there could be live wires in this yeah. wet mud that we're in, and then you had the possibility of swimming pools that were covered in mud that you could easily fall into, and you would sink to the bottom and get stuck in the mud, or manhole covers that had been blown out, and you could fall in through the manhole cover. And there was really a kind of a pause that everybody had to do. So we, we kept moving, and we, they found three people in this house that, that they were able to rescue. These were some of the earliest uh, people that were rescued that night. All right. This was a, one of the... This is a buried automobile. Yeah, a Mercedes uh, that was found. Uh, I don't know where it was originally parked, but it ended up being deposited onto North Jameson Lane, um, South of so this Olive is the Mill. hood ornament. This is the hood ornament of a Mercedes, and that is completely covered in mud and debris, and you, you couldn't see the sides of the Mercedes. That's that's the only thing I recognized, knowing that what kind of car that was. Wow. This is the 101. This is the 101 that morning. This is right just after about sunrise, and you can see it's bank to bank. I mean, that looks like a river. Yeah. And this is looking uh, north. Uh, or west, you know, Santa Barbara. This yeah. is northbound 101, um, and the the guardrail for Olive Mill uh, Bridge had been taken out by rocks. I mean, it had been completely wiped off and and fell into 
the 101. So this is just the debris, like I said, it became a catch basin. I think there's a pumpkin down there. There's all kinds of debris that's in there floating. Oh, that's a pot. I thought it was a football. But yeah, there's no, all kinds of things that are down in there floating about. And the rain is still falling, so it's still continuing to fill. And so this is the northbound 101. This is the north and southbound. I'm standing, about oh. rough, I'm standing roughly in, about the center divider of the 101 freeway. So the northbound lane would be on the so right hand. this is all the lanes. Yeah, this would be the, the northbound lanes would be the right hand side of the photo, and the southbound lanes would be on the left hand side. Okay. Uh, where is this? Yeah, this is one of our captains. This is Dustin McKibben. And uh, he went, made one of the uh, early um, rescues as well. This is behind the home where, um, and, and again, we didn't know um, the location of a lot of these areas. So they were driving around, doing what they can to try and evacuate people. And they met with a person who lived in the area and he told them that there were houses behind this. So he, they walked back there and where that debris pile is below the car, Dustin and, and one of the, uh, local gentlemen who live in that area, they were actually able to hear uh, the muffled cries and they were actually able to find a two-year-old uh, girl and they managed to pull her out. And then what they did was they pulled her out, they were managed, managed to get her out, and then Dustin and his crew ran back to the engine as they were cleaning her airway and getting her out. And they drove her in the fire engine to where the ambulance were weighing over by Vaughn's on Coast Village Road and they were handed the, the child off to the ambulance and then they were taken to Cottage. So they did that several times using, because they had a, a fire engine that was a four-wheel drive, one of the bigger brush engines that they were used, so they were able to clear some of those rocks as they were driving. And they used the fire engine literally as an ambulance trying to get those uh, people as they were evacuating them to the ambulances. And then I, see, I just see that little basketball hoop in the right and it's just yeah it's just heartbreaking it 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 really is and and this is stuff that we're we're not we're not used to dealing with in, in santa barbara i've never dealt with any type of flooding this situation and and i'm 50 years old and i've never dealt with this in my life here in santa barbara county 50? yeah and uh so but the the firefighters that they that they worked they did a tremendous job and it took a toll um and and they came together. It was it was a very. I mean, every fire, especially for the community you work for, is a personal thing. But this took on a, a whole different aspect because it was so personal for a lot of these firefighters. They knew everybody these knew, people. Everybody, everybody was, knew someone um, that was affected by this. And and Dustin and his crew did a tremendous job that morning, as did Adam and the crew that I was with earlier that day as well. Okay. Now this is the inside of somebody's living room? This is the inside of someone's home. This is down on the flat, kind of the flat area, uh, just off of uh, Olive Mill, but just north of North Jamison there. And this is the inside of a house. Um, this shows how much force blew through those walls and just deposited all this stuff. And all these areas have to be searched. You're still looking for folks and you had to go around the best you can looking there. for things. So yes. That's firefighter. He's a uh, Vinny Agapito. He's with the County Fire, and he was out there searching um, through that house, trying to find, you know, whatever we could. Yeah, this is up in uh, Casa de Maria, which is a kind of a spiritual retreat area up off right. San Ysidro, and this is right. the uh, church uh, or the um, in that grounds, and the mud was, you know to about kneecap high inside that church. And it was so just- So what happened, is it like boulder blow through here or what? Uh, yeah, just the mud flow. This was- Just the uh, mud flow Just itself. the mud flow itself. How high was the mud flow at one? Uh, it was about, you can see on the side of the wall, so that's about to about kneecap, a little bit higher. Um, but the whole grounds, it, it took a heavy loss um, for those grounds. It was in, in close proximity to the San Ysidro Ranch. That's where that uh, gas main that, that broke right, we're gonna was see, near there. Uh, we're gonna see that. Yeah. These were just some of the boulders that this is at Hot Springs, about 300 block of Hot Springs Road by Casa Dorinda. And you can see the, the, the creek that the water is supposed to flow to on your left hand side there. And it didn't, you know, hold those banks. And these rocks were deposited onto the road. And that was the big problem was we needed to get to people. The firefighters needed to get there and they were met with these boulders. And we had to figure ways to clear these roads as quick as possible to get to those people that needed the help. Some big boulders. And, and, and what, they needed, what they ended up doing was they, that's how the, those first hours, it was, it was, they had so many helicopters that were made. They made over 120 hoist rescues during those first couple days 
with helicopters from the Coast Guard, the National Guard, uh, Ventura County, the Santa Barbara County, and uh, it, was, it was an amazing job to see those helicopters at work. All right. This is sadly in, in, in one of the homes where um, the, the woman who lived there had... Rebecca Risk. Rebecca Risk, correct, yes. Yeah, she, she unfortunately um, was swept away and, and was found sometime later. Um, um, and you deceased. said that basically the flow or boulders or something almost literally yeah. cut the house in half. Yeah, this is the middle portion of the house, and, and the boulders and the debris basically took the one side of the house and the other side of the house and just blew right through it. And this is her sister um, that is um, having a friend uh, go into the bedroom trying to retrieve some of, of her belongings um, while the search continued at that time uh, for, um, for Rebecca. And her husband? Her husband was swept out as well. He, he was found clinging to a tree um, and was hoist rescued by one of the helicopters and taken to cottage. Oh, that's horrible. This is from the home. The picture that you saw early on in the darkness, this is the home of those people. So this was one of the homes that is was still standing. This is shot from the inside? This is shot from the inside. The bottom house of their, of their house, the bottom floor of their house was completely inundated with mud. So they sec seeked refuge up on the second floor, and that's where they were found, and that's how they were rescued from that second floor, brought down through. We're looking across that area where there were several homes before this happened. And where the firefighters are working is that's members from Montecito Fire, the city fire department, as well as the Long Beach Fire Department. They heard um, the cries uh, from someone and they, that house got basically broken apart and deposited up against the side of a tree. Um, it, they found the tallest and thinnest firefighter they could, uh, a firefighter from Montecito, and he managed to worm his way inside that debris. And they basically, using tools, cut that house around her, away from her, and they were managed to bring out that 14-year-old girl yeah, where she was rescued. And she was trapped in that, in that debris for about six hours Let's until see, they finally yeah. cut her out. And that's, you can see them bringing her out there. This She's on the lower right. This is picture that went around the world. Yeah, and that's what we tried to you know, show the, what the wor hard work that these folks are doing, as well as the human side of trying to get these people to safety. And this was that moment when they brought her out. She managed, after being entangled in that wreckage for a good five, six hours, she came out under her own power, and they were able to get her off of that uh, debris pile and get her to a hospital. And tragically lost several. And, and like we talked about with Twitter, this is how I get those pictures out. And this, these are various newspapers from around the country that showcased the tragedy that was in Montecito. And this just is just a little sample of all the different newspapers that, were, that used that image, as well as some of the other ones um, from that morning. This is Cold Spring Trailhead at East Mountain Drive. And for there's a lot of hikers, it's a popular hiking trail. So you can see very tiny on the right hand, about above, about midway up, you can see two UCSB police officers there. That shows you how much water and force blew through that canyon at the top of East Mountain Drive, which is no longer there, and the Cold Spring Trailhead. So it, it just shows you the amount of water and force that came down those early morning hours. Yeah. This is the 101 freeway across, you're going, I'm looking in the northbound lanes of the 101 freeway across from the Miramar. And this is uh, part of Sycamore, or part of uh, San Ysidro Creek that flooded um, that area as well. It, it didn't awfully- So that's it, the sign for Sheffield. For Sheffield, correct. So we didn't already have just the one pool that was the one above Olive Mill. We actually had a second pool um, south of San Ysidro, and that's where a lot of the traffic got stuck as How well. How did this driver get out? I don't know. The, car, the truck was there by the time I got there. I, I'm assuming he was managed to get himself out and uh, into safety in a fairly short order. How long did it take to close the freeway? Uh, the freeway was shut down for, I want to say, was it, uh, how many days was it shut, shut down for? It was shut down for at least 10 days, yeah. I want to say. And the Caltrans and the, the workers that did that, they did, did a great job clearing that highway as quick as they could. I mean, it, uh, when we looked at that that morning, we didn't think it was going to be open as quickly as they did. And, and they did a tremendous job working around the clock and to that, free that. Um, that video that I, I'm sure most people have seen of the two CHP officers who were driving up and yeah. then the, 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 
debris flow came at them. They turned around. They yeah. lost control of the car. Yeah. But they were the ones who really sounded the alarm about the 101 and, and, and yeah. had it shut down pretty and that, quick. that had to have been terrifying for them as they were sounded, coming around that corner sounded like to it. be floating and then all of a sudden turned around and they were lucky to get traction and get out of there as quick as they could. All right, let's go back to that culvert. Where is this? Yeah, this is one of the mini culverts. This is up off top of Lilac Drive. And that's just completely covered um, with rocks and debris. And it was just another one of those choke points um, for, the, for the creeks and for the tributaries when all that debris came down and, and the water has to go somewhere. You're not gonna stop water. And it took that path of least resistance and it spilled up over the top and, and, and continued to flow down eventually. Again, What's in, normally in this culvert? Is this used for, for storm water? Or yeah, water? yeah, exactly. And it was blocked on the north side of, of Lilac there with yeah. rocks and debris. Okay. This is just one of those kind of, I'm not a big inspirational guy, but this is one of those inspirational moments. It was late in the day of that first day. These helicopter crews had been working tirelessly throughout the day. This is and the first day? Still? This is the first day. And we had this amazing rainbow that formed over Montecito. And uh, it was a complete rainbow. It stretched from end to end. And the helicopter, one of our helicopters, uh, Copter 308s, and their crew were flying back to do, continue to do more hoists and they just, I just looked up and saw them as they were crossing in front of that rainbow. Okay. Wow. I mean, you really get a sense with that how just unbelievable the conditions were and, yeah. and imagine what, how terrifying it was for people. And, and it it had to have been. It, I mean, those boulders and that debris, I mean, it made noise. I mean, th those things just didn't appear. Those came down, and it, I can only imagine how terrifying it had to have been for those people. They knew that it was dark, and it, they, they, they came down, the boulders came down, and they didn't have time to prepare. It's different with a fire. The fire is okay. You can see the fire. There it is. It's getting closer. It's getting closer. But with this, it was dark. You didn't know. It, was just it had sudden. a little bit of rain. We had so much rain in such a short amount of time. And people, some people did, bless them, they did the right thing. They, they packed all of their stuff into their car, their baby blankets, their pictures, everything into their car, had it pointed out down the driveway, thinking they'll get out in time. And the floods came, and they had to seek refuge at the top of their house, and they watched their car float away with all their stuff. And it, it, it's heartbreaking, all the stories, and the, li the loss of life. And everybody knows someone who, who, two, two who died in this. Two people still not found. And those two that are still missing. And it, it just breaks your heart that, that the crews are still out there and they're still searching. They're not going to give up. But they're, they're, they're and we're, the sad part about this whole thing is we're still early in the rainy season. And, right. uh, it, and, it, and as much as all that water and that rain came down those Montecito canyons, we were very fortunate that that one creek was uh, Montecito Creek. The very next creek to the west was is, uh, Sycamore Canyon Creek. And that was just comparatively a trickle of water that came down there, just the way the, the rain fell. And we're, we're still not out of it. And the people really need to, and I can, if I can encourage people to go to the County of Santa Barbara webpage and, and sign up for alerts. Um, if we can't reach you, we can't help you. We really want you to sign up for your alerts. You can get text alerts on your phone. Your home phone will be called, your email, and we'll try and get those messages out to you. And we really want you to heed those warnings. We, we don't take them lightly. We don't just say, okay, we're, we don't want you to see the Giants game. We're right. going to put this warning out there. We, we want you to heed those warnings for your safety. Okay. Well, this is obviously a historic, um, horribly tragic event that's happened, and it's going to shape not only Montecito, but I think uh, Santa Barbara and land use planning for, for a long time to come. And I think Mike's images of this are going to be an important part of the historic record. And Mike, thank you so much for coming and sharing uh, the, the images and with us. Um, and uh, thank you uh, very much to uh, our director, Oscar Gutierrez, and to uh, our crew, Ashe, Ryan, and Susie. Uh, and as always, uh, our producer, Hap Freund, uh, please visit our website, newsmakerswithjr.com, where you can check out my regular blog posts on politics and media and news in Santa Barbara and beyond. Thanks for watching, Newsmakers. We'll see you next time.